The city of thought has many doors. In the early 50s as I remember an Arabic book was published entitled Life Taught Me, which included a collection of articles written by writers, with each writer narrating in his article the most important things he had learned from his life, and there was an English book soon to appear, which revolved around such an orbit, as it contained what was decided in this regard by a number of intellectual figures in the West, and the English book was entitled, That Is My Belief. I remember that the Arab publisher wanted his book to include a group of Arab intellectuals along with a group of Western scholars, whose statements were mentioned in the English book after it was translated into Arabic, and I was one of the Arab publishers chosen by the publisher. The most important thing that life taught me, as I saw it on that date, was that the more years a person goes by, the less intense his emotions are, and the more clear his mind becomes. Meaning that a single situation is presented to a single person twice, separated by a period of time, such as the period between the ages of 20 and 40 for example, or between 40 and 60. So that one situation has an impact that is intense with its emotions, and that is the first time, and an impact that is characterized by coldness of thought and its balancing of various aspects. And that the second time, since a person increases in maturity with age, it can be said that the calmness of the mind in turning matters over before reacting to the situation at hand is an indication of the advancement of its owner just as a quick, agitated person is an indicator of his rudeness. I gave examples from my life, including what I witnessed in my paternal grandmother, in two cases of the death of her children, about 20 years apart. As for the first case, her son was brought to her, who was a teacher in a swan, and he drowned there during a Nile cruise near the waterfalls, and his body came to her in our village, so say whatever you want, in a panic that amounted to madness. As for the second case, I was the one who carried my uncle's body to her. His death took place in Cairo, so we knocked on her door after midnight, and she did not know anything about the matter. So when she was surprised by the body of her eldest son, she remained silent for about two minutes, then she shouted my son, and then remained silent for all the days that we stayed in the village to perform the funeral rituals. The two situations as you can see are similar, but the reaction in them differed from the wisdom of reason to the madness of emotion. I said all this to follow up with a question I asked myself today, which is, if a publisher came asking you to write about what life has taught you, what would you say? Is it the same answer I gave in the early 1950s? I responded to her question to myself, saying, yes, he is the answer, after a very important addition was added to it, which is an addition that is specific to the mental life of those who want to live it in a correct way, and its bottom line is that a person should not narrow his horizons by stopping from the subject presented for consideration, a position in which he says either or, and there is no third to them, while most of what is presented to a person in his intellectual life is something that brings together the two aspects or several aspects that he initially thinks do not come together. Years have passed, during which I and my fellow philosophy professors were engaged in a scientific quarrel over what the correct philosophical view is, some of them said it was the ideal view, and what it means for those engaged in philosophical thought is the priority of pure thought over the experience of the senses. There were also some of them who said it was the existential view. It means that the freedom of a person to make his decision is guaranteed to him, so that he is then morally responsible. A person is not made by factors outside himself, as much as he himself is made by the decisions he takes of his free will, in the various situations of his life, and I was of the opinion that the correct philosophical view is what makes scientific knowledge its main subject, and what gives the testimony of the senses the first place in judging that knowledge is right or wrong, to the last of the conflicting tendencies between us. But later, in a moment of maturity, I asked myself, are these trends truly conflicting, or are they in fact complementary trends? Meaning that the completely correct view is the one that brings together all of these trends in one area. This opinion was made clear to me so clearly that I became astonished at myself and astonished at all my colleagues in their intellectual battles. How had I previously thought that it was either experimental science or nothing? A person's life has many aspects, and a person is not complete as a person without all of them. He lives a scientific life, he lives an artistic, moral, religious life, he lives as a citizen among other citizens in one society, and so on. If I had previously chosen a philosophical direction concerned with the aspect of scientific life, this would not have meant that others would not be interested in another aspect of all the aspects from which the human being is formed. 
The matter in this case is similar to a group of people, all of whom stood together looking at one view, but no. Some of them began to look at it from their own angle, and one of them thought to himself, is this place suitable for establishing a football field? Another thinks to himself, what if I brought my tools tomorrow and sat down to draw this scene, as it is breathtaking with its formations, lines, and colors. A third thought to himself, wondering, how had it not occurred to him to catch fish from the river flowing there? And fourth, and fifth, the place they are looking at accommodates all of this. So can we say in this case, that the directions of those people are conflicting? Or is it more correct to say that some of them complement each other? Such an imaginary contradiction occurs between the doctrines of art criticism, as they are in fact different angles of view, all of which can be combined to form one comprehensive view. In this case, the recipient's understanding of the literary or artistic piece that is the subject of consideration increases, and for the sake of explanation that increases the issue. Clearly, I summarize here what I have previously mentioned in detail in many places. If a writer or artist produces one of his products, such as publishing a novel, or displaying a painting, or a piece of music, or whatever type of creativity you like, and then that literary or artistic product is exposed to critics, it is possible for each critic among them to have an angle of consideration from four angles. He either finds himself drawn to the rule of something in his nature, until he discerns from the piece that he is examining with critical study. The personality of the writer or artist who produced it. There is no doubt that the creator has no choice but to pour the characteristics of himself into what he creates. But the critic who pays attention from the piece that saved this gesture, he is someone who is naturally inclined towards revealing the psychological aspects. We are not wrong if we say about him that literature or art, in his view, is only a means for what is more important, and which is more important, which is revealing the truths of the soul. By this measure, psychology has priority over literature and art for him. But the critic may have chosen another angle, as he also wants to study the coin piece, in order to discover from it something about the social life that must have surrounded the writer or artist while he was creating what he created, and in this case, we truly say as we said in the previous case, that literature and art are only two means to what is most important. And this most important thing is to know the truth about social life. It is as if we are saying by this that sociology is the goal and literature and art serve it, the critic may choose a third angle other than the previous two, which is to study the coin piece in order to discover something behind it. This time, it is not his knowledge of the soul of its creator, nor is it his knowledge of the social life that surrounded its creator while he worked, but rather it is to look into the truth of his own self to know it through impressions. What the coin piece left in it, and in this case the critic has the ability of a writer and artist, because the criticism he produces is literature in itself, and all that matters is that it is literature inspired by other literature. However, there is a fourth angle that the critic may choose, which is not to try to discover anything behind the coin piece, because it is an end in itself, not just a means to what is more important than it, and then the coin piece itself is the one on which the monetary effort is focused. What are its parts? How are these parts connected to each other? Or in other words, the goal of criticism in this case is to study the form through which the presented piece becomes literature or art. Are these four positions conflicting, or is it closer to being correct in their matter, is to say that each of them comes in addition to the other trends? If we assume that a reader reads a criticism of a novel from only one of these angles, then the reader who reads a criticism from two angles will have a greater understanding of its secrets, and his understanding will increase if he reads a criticism from three angles, and his understanding will be complete if he reads a criticism of the novel from all four angles. In the very few efforts that I made in the field of literary and artistic criticism, I tended to choose the fourth angle, that is, the study of form, believing that it is the angle that serves literature, insofar as it is literature, and art insofar as it is art, and does not serve them insofar as they are two means, for psychology, sociology, or new literary creativity. In light of this, which I have presented extensively, I remember the letter that came to me from Mr. Bahadarwish, Bachelor of Philosophy, which he sent after reading about my approach to criticism, as I explained in my book The Story of a Mind in which he says, In your book The Story of a Mind you stated your position on literary criticism. I understood from it that you believe that literary criticism must be limited to the literary work, whatever that work may be. 
so we study the text itself, regardless of its author and circumstances. The critic has limited verbal formations. His whole mission is to analyze it. Here we say, the artist himself whether he is a writer, a sculptor or a musician is a product of society, the environment, and the era in which he lives. The literary piece or the painted picture has many factors involved in its production. Understanding the psychological and social life of the artist greatly assists the critic in his analysis. For a literary effect, do you think that if you had read Socrates's preoccupation with defining the meanings of freedom equality good and evil without knowing that this definition had been written before Christ, would you not have mocked this man who preoccupies himself with defining meanings known to people, or were you content with analyzing this work as a literary critic? Didn't our judgment of the greatness of these monuments come from our knowledge that Socrates tried to correct what the sophists had corrupted, and from our complete knowledge of the era in which he lived? If you did not know the time in which these works were written, and you were told that they were born today, where would you classify them? Do you consider it a literary or philosophical influence? The author of the speech ended, and we say. It is clear that if the author of the letter were a literary critic, he would have chosen for himself the angle in which the critic would try to discern from the criticized text the psychology of its author on the one hand and the circumstances of his society at the time of its writing on the other hand in order to increase his understanding of the text he was criticizing. And there is nothing wrong with that. I think he saw from our explanation for the four possible angles of the critical position, the critic's choice of one of them does not mean cancelling the other angles, but rather he leaves them to others if they wish. I have said about myself that in literary criticism, I choose to analyze the text itself, regardless of what is behind it. This is similar to examining the threads with which it is woven before purchasing it and it is permissible for others to be interested in its colors, not the threads of its weaving. I do not want to miss alerting the author of the speech that he mixed literature with philosophy when he gives me an example of Socrates's analyses of the meanings of certain words and then asks me, was it possible for us to ignore the time in which Socrates lived? I answer him that the literary critic is in a different position. Because while Socrates presents us with ideas literature presents us with forms, if you like the geometry in which the branches and leaves of a tree are arranged, is it a condition that you know when the seed of this tree was sown? And I return again to the speech to mention what was mentioned in the rest of it, and it he says, with regard to the point that your excellency mentioned, saying, art is capturing an individual's attitude towards what the world around us is full of, there is no disagreement about that, but why is it that someone who says a general truth is considered far from high art? Turks hereby judge this line of poetry to be far from high art because it states a declarative truth. The sort is truer news than books and its definition is the border between seriousness and play. The speech of the author of the speech ended in this continuation, and we say, if you knew what you must know about the characteristics of literature and are in general, which is that in order for it to be literature at all, its material must have been formulated in a form that is a form. The writer chooses it. I say that if you had known that, perhaps you would not have asked this question. Because the line of poetry that I mentioned would not have been poetry in the first place if its vocabulary had not been formulated in this special system and fell into this special meter. This and that constitute the form which is the initial pass for its entry into the world of art, and after that comes a question. Another is, is it high art, and why? If I were to highlight my method of criticism to him, I would have focused my attention on the vocabulary and the way it is put together. So why first did Abu Tamim choose that simple C for his poem? Then look secondly at the dualities mentioned in the verse the sword and the books, its borders being the letter, the seriousness and the play, for they are dualities rich in their connotations. Then I notice thirdly the synergy of the adjacent letters in creating the melody, such as the juxtaposition of the S plus N and the SD, the repetition of the letter HA, and the juxtaposition of the B and B, and so on. But I do not deny the other angles from which we look at this house, because it certainly increases my understanding of him. For example, if I knew that the books mentioned here do not mean books in general, as most repeaters of this verse think, but rather they are astrology books. This is because when El Mutism wanted to war with the Romans, and the Romans were not prepared at that time for war, they planted an astrologer for him, telling him that calculating the stars indicated that if he had fought the Romans at that time, he would have lost the war. Perhaps this statement caused some hesitation among Al Mutism, and here is Abu Tamim recited his poem to him, from which this verse begins, and its meaning, as is clear, is that the true news about the results of the war with the Romans is the edge of swords not in the prophecies of astrologers. I say that my knowledge of this historical that is, social background, increases my clarity and my appreciation of the verse from its standpoint. Its actual significance, 
But even if we do not know this historical background about it, its artistic form remains sublime poetry. I think the questioner can see the uniqueness of the poet in his verbal structure. Now, let me gather the parts of my discussion to leave the reader with a conclusion that is easy to preserve in memory, so that he can return to it whenever he wishes either to accept what is in it or to oppose it and that result is that my life has taught me that the city of thought has many doors, meaning that one topic can be approached by thought from several sides. Without the rulings on the different aspects contradicting each other, rather they may be complementary and strengthen each other.